Today, we are going to start with uh, Amnesty by Nadeen Gaudima. Now, this particular lesson talks about apartheid in South, South Africa. Nadeen uh, Gaudima was born in Springs Transvaal. I am quoting the lesson from page 73 of Zeitgeist. This Transvaal is a mining town outside Johannesburg. Uh, she was educated in a convent school. Uh, she began reading. She was a voracious reader. She began reading top classic novels like of Dostoevsky and uh, Tolstoy at a very young age. Then she began writing at the age of nine. And uh, what uh, she witnessed, Gordimer witnessed how the white minority increasingly weakened the few rights of the black majority and it emerged as a foundation stone of her activism against racial segregation. So she saw that the blacks were being suppressed by the whites. And this was the foundation stone for her. It was because of this that she started to write vehemently against this white supremacy. Uh, she, uh, she spent a year at the uh, university in Johannesburg, Johannesburg. Uh, but she did not, she was not able to receive a degree. And then she, she um, sent, uh, she went to the university, she started lecturing at universities in Harvard and uh, in America because, you see, her writings were so good. And uh, she was also an ardent supporter of African National Congress. The African National Congress was a, was one of the foundations for liberating South Africa. I think you will definitely remember Nelson Mandela. So Nelson Mandela was the first uh, president of the liberated or the free South Africa. And uh, it was only due to this African National Congress that uh, that unity uh, through which they were able to get freedom. The South Africans were able to get freedom. In 1991, she won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, being the first South African to win the award and the first woman to win in 25 years. So these are a little bit about uh, Nadine Gaudima. Uh, she more, wrote mostly about this exile and alienation. So she liked this was more of her topics about exile and alienation. Exile is, you know, going out or throwing you away or uh, throwing you out of, or uh, you are escaping from your homeland, an alienation. So you are in another land and you are an alien. Uh, Amnesty was uh, published in the New Yorker magazine in 1991. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1991, the same year. Uh, she also won another award in 2007, the Chevalier uh, de la Légion d'Honneur Award. This is, I think, uh, instituted by Fra by France, and she unfortunately died in her sleep. Maybe it is one of the best deaths possible. And many of her books were banned by the apartheid regime. But during the apartheid, more, many of her books were not in, in session, in session, or they were they could not be sold because basically she was trying to write against the apartheid. Now, in this particular lesson. Uh, prior to uh, going to the lesson, we will have a small revision of the small of the story. This is found in page 74. So I'm going to read that. That's the last paragraph of the introduction of uh, the the chapter, the short story, Amnesty. Amnesty is a short story originally published in the New Yorker in 1991. The New Yorker is a magazine, something like India Today, and later included in the collection Jump and other stories was selected to the anthology called Freedom, published by Amnesty International, celebrating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The narrator of the story, now we're going to start the story. The narrator of the story is a young South African woman, the fiancé of the nameless protagonist. So we really do not know who the, uh, protag the protagonist is, uh, who, who the fiancé is. We do not know the name. So we are going to call that person A, antagonist. So protagonist, antagonist. Protagonist is the main character. Antagonist is 
the lover, we do not know the name. In a flashback of the first person narrative, she tells the story of her potential husbands. So she is telling the story of this person, of this fiancé, or of this antagonist. Who is this person? He is a South African black trade union, unionist who was arrested after inciting riots among workers. So he was a black African and he, you know, uh, urged others to fight against the whites. And because of that, he was arrested. Then uh, at one particular point of time, he was given freedom. So the freedom from imprisonment. The story portrays the deep racial division that infected South Africa under apartheid regime. Through the sharp, incisive, unsentimental narrative, the narrator shows how oppressed the people of South Africa were, and especially how the women were emotionally and physically affected. The story also reveals how the prison serves as an instrument in the hands of totalitarian and sometimes democratic governments, where the individuals are subjected to close surveillance and how the innocent ones take the pain inflicted by the state. In a detailed examination of the devastating psychology effects of political persecution on the lives of ordinary South Africans, Godima delineates the relationship between the personal and the political in terms of human rights. So here she is talking about this person, this fiancé, this lover, this antagonist, who they are really not married, just a fiancé. But unfortunately, this person is a black, and this person fought for the rights of freedom. South Africa, freedom, she, he fought for the rights. And because of that, he was jailed. And he was imprisoned. And in the prison, also, he was you know, subjected to a torturous life. And at one particular point of time, he was released. So that release is also shown here. And then, do, uh, the, he, so we learn of the release, and we are now going into the story where that release is happening. So prior to that, I would just like to show you a few more uh, slides. See, this is what is happening. We are now in South Africa. We are in South Africa. And in South Africa, I'll just take my point to South Africa. I'm sure you know where South Africa is. So this is South Africa. And we are going to a farmhouse in Johannesburg, in uh, somewhere, somewhere here. And we are going to talk. We're going to talk in the first person narrative. That is this lady. She is going to talk to us. So it's a first person narrative. And the theme of this whole short story is how people change over time. So we'll be discussing that at the end. So how people can change completely over time. And this is what we are going to see in this short story. Visits, uh, goes to the city to work. And when he goes to the city, he, he works there uh, and visits her only once a month. But even then, that once a month is quite good for the lady. And soon he finds that the narrator, this lady, the narrator, she finds that her lover has joined the union, the African National Congress. So this African National Congress is the is the uh, group which is you know trying to liberate South Africa. So this lover has joined. Till that time he was in the farm, he was with her, but now he has suddenly joined the African National Congress. Now he goes to jail. He goes to jail. He's on trial. And, if, and uh, he is sentenced to six years of jail. So, Aravasham imprisonment get to know. Now, in, in, this, in between that time, that she is pregnant. This, our narrator, our lady is pregnant. And uh, the, the, she, 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 that child is a girl, is given a name. The name is Inkululeko. 
inkululeko. So inkululeko. So the lover is sentenced for six years. Now, um, maybe because of good work in the jail, he comes back after five years. So he's released from jail after five years. So naturally, the daughter is now old. The daughter must be approximately three or three or four years old. So the daughter, he's, the daughter has been given a lot of uh, stories about the father, but the daughter rec doesn't recognize him because she's changed so much. The the uh, the the lover has changed so much. The daughter also also changed so much. So they do, don't recognize each other, and the narrator also feels distanced. Till now, you know the the there was a there was a very good love affair between the narrator and this lover, but unfortunately now that sort of a estrangement or that sort of a distancing is now seen. That is the climax. Now, the falling action is that the lover goes away again. She finds out that she is pregnant with a second child. So then one more child is, re is ready. But again, she has no in she is still not married. And there is no intention of marrying her. And finally, we'll find that he she keeps hoping that he will come back and he will be his old self again. So this is basically the, the plot summary, or this is what we are going to see in the in the story. Now, there are certain terms that we I would like to tell you prior to starting the story. The first uh, um, is about what you call the welt. It's welt and not weld, welt. Welt is basically an open, uncultivated country or grassland. It is conventionally divided by altitude into high wealth, middle wealth, and uh, low wealth. So uh, cultivation is done here. Uh, certain places, you know, there is no cultivation, primarily because the land is not, uh, uh, the, the certain lands in South, in South Africa are under the extreme uh, desert conditions of the Kalahari. So you have two deserts in South Africa, in Africa, the uh, Sahara and the Kalahari Desert. So this is bordering the Kalahari Desert. So uh, still certain places can be cultivated, but generally a welt is called, is known as an open, uncultivated country or what you call grassland. And you have high welt, middle welt, and low welt. Now apartheid, this is apartheid. Apartheid is a political uh, social system in Africa. Uh, in South Africa during the white minority rule and there you know they enforced racial discrimination against non-whites mainly focusing on their skin color and facial features so this existed between 1948 and the early 1990s so you can see in that in the first photo you can find uh, caution beware of natives so in their own land the land of the Africans the land of the South Africans even there such boards are coming and saying that you must be careful about the natives, about the black people. And you can look at the beach also. So you can imagine a beach like Calicut. And in Calicut Beach, there is, let's say, an area where, which is cordoned, which is cordoned off. That is, you cannot go there because it is a white area. Only white people can go there. So such things were very prevalent in South Africa. And uh, the, the orchestrator or the person who actually liberated them was Nelson Mandela. And this is Nelson Mandela. At this point, I'll also like to show you uh, a, a little bit about the a few more photos about the apartheid, and uh, I you can see one or two photos which I would like to show. You. One photo that I would like to show you is a bench, a bench which is now old, of course, but in this bench you can see how it is, you know, very uh, on the bench it is written uh, that. Uh, that only whites are allowed on this bench. I think the, yeah, I think you can see the smaller photo. So it's written the whites only. Uh, another thing that I would like to show you is the photo here. And in the photo here, you can see the two people sitting uh, on the, on the, and uh, you can see that. Uh, 
the only whites are allowed. You can see the whites turning on one side and the blacks sitting here. So this is the only for blacks and this is only for whites. So like this, there are, I, I think there's even one other photo which shows, you saw the photo about the beach and all that. But there's one particular photo that I'd like to show you. It's actually about a railway station. Now this is the railway station. And, and, and in here you see the railway st uh, stations and you see the public premises. Then the amenities have been reserved for the exclusive use of white persons only. So if white persons want to use a bathroom, they have to go through this way. And if non-Europeans uh, non have to go this way, and the Europeans have to go this way. So you see, like this and this, I think even this one more about a, in a railway station where you know the black the blacks white have to see this is a shop but non-white shop so no uh, non-whites cannot enter this is also another shop where whites have to enter through one way the blacks have to enter through another way so you see the discrimination was so bad during those days uh, between 1948 and 1970 and this is the railway station where uh, Pretoria Railway Suburban Station where whites have to go through one path and the blacks have to go through another path. So uh, such things and you see another very dangerous sign. Native Indians are colored. I hope that the, the, yeah, this is a sign. Natives, Indians and colored. If you enter these premises at night, you will be listed as, as missing. Armed guards shoot on sight. Savage dogs devour the cops you have been warned. So if something happens to you, don't blame us because you are not supposed to enter this place. Uh, the natives and Indians and colored people are not supposed to enter this place. If you enter, you are entering at your own risk and you will be shot dead and you will be armed guards will shoot you. Uh, savage dogs will devour you and you your, your address will not even be there. That is even your bones will not be there. So you have been warned, please do not enter. So such atrocities were there in this. And this particular uh, article, this particular short story came in the New Yorker. New Yorker is a magazine. Uh, it came in the New Yorker magazine in, in August 1927, where this young woman narrates the story of her potential husband's freedom from imprisonment. So she is talking about her potential husband. It is just a fiancé and she's just talking about how this potential husband is, uh, that story is being narrated by Nadine Gordima in the lesson Amnesty. I'm going to the text. When we heard that he was released, I ran all over the farm and through the fences to our people on the next farm to tell everybody. I only saw after on my barbed wire. And there was a scratch with blood on my shoulders. So I was so happy that I knew that he was going to be released. I was so happy that uh, my lover was going to come back. And because of that, uh, I was, you know, uh, um, I was uh, so happy that, you know, he's going to uh, come back and uh, one minute, one minute, just get that part ready. Uh, <clears throat> that I didn't even know that there was a fence there. So my shoulder had a little bit of uh, scratching because uh, the uh, the barbed wire, uh, the kambi, uh, the barbed wire actually scratched me. And uh, even though I had blood, I was still not uh, worried about it. He went away from this place nine years ago, signed up to work in a town with what they call a construction company. So he, he had gone from this, my, from my place nine years ago, building glass walls up to the sky. For the first two years, he came home for a weekend, once a month and two weeks at Christmas. Excuse me. So for the first two years, he came home for the weekend. See the timeline. First two years, he was rather okay. Every every two weeks, he would come home. So he was my fiancé. And two weeks at Christmas. That was when he asked my father for me. 
and he began to pay. So that was the time during Christmas. He asked my father so that he could marry me. And he began to pay. So maybe there is a bride price. Wow, give me a minute. The um, bride price. So uh, during Christmas, this lover, this fiance asked for me to my father. Shall I marry her? And uh, maybe there must have been some uh, bride price uh, in England. Paiso or that now. Uh, and, uh, this so, sort of maybe dowry system. Uh, and he began to pay. Uh, maybe he would have said, an installment I did that. I'm, I would, I'll give you an installments. And he and I thought that in three years, he would have paid enough for us to get married. So within three years, I thought, you know, I would get married to him. But then he started wearing that T-shirt. He told us he'd joined the union. So at that time, he told us that he has joined African National Congress. So this is joining a union. And I think, you know, once you join a union, you have to, you know, uh, you have to show allegiance to the union. You have to be very sincere to the union. He told us about the strike, how he was one of the men who went to talk to the bosses because some others had been laid off after the strike. He'd always, he's always good at talking, even in English. He was the best at the farm school. He used to read the newspapers, the Indian wrap soaps, the Indian wraps, soaps, and sugar in when you buy at the store. He was he used to read the newspapers, the Indian wraps, show, soap and sugar in when you buy at the store. So you see, this is very common even now when you go to a vegetable shop and you buy something instead of a plastic bag, they wrap a newspaper. So he was so good in English that he would read those newspapers. So you can Im imagine in Africa those days, the sellers, the traders were Indians. Indians is actually ours, uh, us Indians. We had gone, a lot of us had gone towards uh, South Africa and uh, Africa to sell. And the, that was the Gulf. Those days, the Gulf, the Mecca, those days was actually the uh, was Africa because Africa was rich in oil. South Africa was also rich in gold and diamonds. So many Indians had translocated, had you know, located themselves towards India. Uh, that's the only reason why Gandhiji went to uh, South Africa to see the Indians over there. Uh, so uh, when this newspaper, uh, when there was an item that the people bought and there was a newspaper wrapping, he would open the newspaper and he would read that. And that too in English. So he was a voracious reader. He could speak in English. He was one of the good people, uh, one of the better ones who could speak English. There was trouble at the hostel when he had, where he had a bed and riots over paying rent in the townships. He had told me, just me, not the old ones, that wherever people were fighting against the way we are treated, they were doing it for all of us on the farms as well as the towns and the unions were with them. He was with them making speeches, marching. So one day he told me secretly that, uh, you know, I am also with them. I am also uh, being with the union, with the African National Congress. So wherever they go, if there is a problem, I go with them and I help them. I speak out, I talk to them, I make speeches. And because of that, I talk to the bosses. I am, the, I am one of those important people. All these things this lover had told her. The third year we heard he was in prison. So three years passed, we hear that now he is in jail. Instead of getting married, instead of getting married, we didn't know where to find him until he went on trial. So we didn't know, there was no internet those days. There was no uh, television those days. So we didn't know where to find him. We, we would look into the papers and one day we found out that these people were on trial and our particular day we found his name there. That is how we understood that he's going to court and 
be he would be he would stand trial the case was heard in a town far away i couldn't go often to the court because by that time i had passed my eighth standard and i was working in the farm school also my parents were short of money two of my brothers who had gone away to work in the town didn't send home so two of my brothers were already working but they didn't send home either avaru paisa ingotti aichilla they didn't send money usually the boys are supposed to go when they work they are supposed to send home money to their parents so two of my brothers who had gone away into work in town didn't send home i suppose they lived with girlfriends and had to buy things for them but that is what i am thinking maybe they have got their girlfriends and you know they are staying with them and naturally they need money to pay you know, for the girls and all those things for the for their for their life so how can they pay their parents so i think in india we've got this social system where in the parents are looked after by their children at least in our generation this is what i also do i look after my parents and i hope that you people will also do the same so this is something which generally is not there in the western countries the western countries the parents fend for themselves the children fend for themselves you really need not look after your parents if at all you look after your parents they are sent to an old age home and they, again they live their own life so the culture is totally different i don't know which one you agree with but whatever it is here also we find that the boys who were supposed to send money to uh, to their parents did not do that so i believe or the narrator believes that they might have had girlfriends there and they were living with them and they have forgotten their parents uh, my father and other brother work here for the boar and the pay is very small so here my father and another brother of mine works for the boars boars are the whites afrikaans you call them a f r i k a a n e r s afrikaners and the pay is very small so you are working in a you as a black this narrator this lady's father and brother they are working in a farm land the welt so you know that grasslands are very difficult to cultivate and there they are paid very little we have two goats a few cows we are allowed to graze and a path of land and a patch of land where my mother can grow vegetables no cash from that so we have a little bit of land we got two cows a few cows they can they can graze in the welt then you've got two goats and there are vegetables for this vegetables we don't get any money at all when i saw him in the court so like that one day i am going to the court and i am seeing him when i saw him in the court he looked beautiful in a blue suit and a white and a striped shirt and a brown tie all the accused his comrades he said were well dressed the union bought us the clothes so that the judges and the prosecutor would know they weren't dealing with stupid yes bass black men who didn't know their rights so the union african national congress they bought these dresses for them so that when the judge looks at them they would understand that you know they are not these stupid blacks they are you know educated blacks who are slightly better than the others and that they have got somebody who is going to look after them the um, the union bought the black clothes so that the judge and the prosecutor would know they were in dealing about uh, with the stupid yes bass black men who didn't know their rights these things and everything else about the court and trial he explained to me when i was allowed to visit him in jail so once i was allowed to visit him in jail and at that time he told me about all these things our little girl was born while the trial went on and when i brought the baby to court the first time to, to show him his comrades hugged him and then hugged me across the barrier of the prisoners dock and they had clubbed together to give me some money as a present for the baby so see so this is the during the jail time the baby is born the baby girl and at that time just to show the girl just to show the child uh, 
this narrator, this lady went the, to show the child. At that time, his comrades hugged him. So not him, his comrades hugged him. So his comrades hugged him and then hugged me across the barrier of the uh, prisoners' docks. And they clubbed together to give me some money as a present. So uh, actually, it's not the baby. It's actually he, his comrades hugged him. So his comrades were very close with him. And then they hugged me across the barrier. So the lover really did not hug the lover. The male lover did not hug the female lover. And at the same time, uh, they had given, they clubbed together a little bit of money. They collected a little bit of money as a present for the baby. And he chose the name for her, Inkululeko. Inkululeko. So the name that he chose for her was Inkulu Leko. Inkulu Leko. One, we'll stop with the last paragraph. Then the trial was over and he got six years. So the judge pronounced the verdict and the verdict was six years of jail. And uh, okay, so the trial was over and he got six years. He was sent to the island. Now, this is the island, it's called Robin Island. We all knew about the island, our leaders had been there so long, but I have never seen the sea except to color it in blue at school, and I couldn't imagine a piece of earth surrounded by it. I could only think of a cake of dung dropped by a cattle floating in a pool of rainwater they had crossed. The water showing the sky like a looking glass, blue. I was ashamed only to think that. He then told me how the glass walls showed the pavement trees and the other buildings in the high streets and the colors of the cars and the clouds as the crane lifted him on a platform higher and higher through the sky to work at the top of a building. So this is Robben Island. Now. Robben Island is a place where the famous prisoner, Nelson Mandela, was also robbed for 18 of his 27 years. So he was jailed for 27 years. And out of that 18 years, he was uh, jailed in this island, Robben Island. And, I, so, uh, and this is a place uh, where, you know, not many people can escape. No, almost no one has escaped from Robben Island. It's an island. And if you escape from this, you are shot at sight. So to her, that comparison is so beautiful. And I think you should remember that. This can be asked as an annotation also. Uh, a cake of dung dropped by cattle floating in a pool of rainwater. So this narrator, this lady, she has never seen the blue sea. She has never, uh, she all she can, all she has done is colored this in her coloring book. So when this narrated, when she knew about Robben Island, when she understood about Robben Island, that it's, it's an island and that it's like a jail, she couldn't, you know, visualize it. All what she visualized was a cake of dung. A cake of dung is something like chanagam. Dropped by cattle into a pool of rainwater. So there is a puddle, there is a rainwater somewhere. Adile ikala. Uh, buffalo, other uh, put a cake of dung, or uh, the uh, excretion, excretion has happened, and that is floating. This is all that she can imagine about Robin Island. We will stop here for today, and we will continue tomorrow at 8 30. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just stop the recording.